Hello, Alexander. Hi, Kevin. Good morning. IFM Alexander talks a lot about uh, sort of mechanical uh, organization of the of the torso and of the body, and he seems to be working with a model, a representation of the, how the torso should be organized, and he seems to be teaching that to his younger, his uh, earlier pupils. So can you talk a bit about your understanding of the model and how this relates to coordinating actions according to the to the model or the representation? Yes, uh, there is a, a basic fact is that um, we can uh, start to think about actions before performing the actions. We can uh, imagine uh, how we want to well make two movements at the same time. Alexander always talks about coordinating acts or preliminary acts that would uh, in fact prepare for any gesture we want to make. And so when you place yourself from the point of view of the pupil, the pupil comes to have a, a lesson because of a problem because the pupil wants to improve. For example, very often we have people with uh, back problems or breathing conditions or uh, difficulty to concentrate. And they, they notice how agitated they are, how uh, agitated they look when they are sitting somewhere. I've, I've gone, sometimes I remember just one, uh, one well, uh, a decider, what we call in France, where people that had to sit in, in big meetings and, uh, and, well, discuss contracts and money and all this. And he just wanted to learn to sit, to sit calmly, to be able to be sitting for one hour, two hours, three hours, if need be, and stay focused and stay organized. And so he came to have lessons. Of course, when he started the lessons, it was obvious that uh, he could not sit for any amount of time without fiddling with his hands, with his feet, with his knees. He was always readjusting. And, uh, and of course, uh, in that case, there are incorrect movements that can be shown, that can be seen. So uh, we don't ask people to stop incorrect movements. We, we have this idea that it's possible to stop the incorrect thing, to let the right thing happen. Well, yes, but uh, this uh, completely blinds the mind of the real question is that how do you, uh, do you get somebody to uh, stop one movement that is incorrect? Because Alexander has a representation. In his representation, all the movements you perform with any part, with, with it conscious or not, that is a movement you do with your feet because you're agitated or a movement because you want to reach for your keyboard, for example, uh, the two movements are linked with other movements. For Alexander, it's impossible to isolate a movement from the organization or what you call the coordination of all the movements. So then how do you stop a movement? <laughs> Uh, just uh, having the idea, I am going to inhibit. Well, anybody will discover that this does not work. You can spend years <laughs> wanting to inhibit a movement if you don't understand that all movements are interconnected and it's only by organizing the whole series of movements that you can start to affect a specific movement. This is the basic principle of the means whereby that is the real foundation of Alexander's work. Then uh, you don't understand. Well, first uh, we need to, to well to, to step down slightly because the uh, you can I cannot speak like this to a pupil that is coming to have lessons with me. Uh, the first thing is that we need to get to. Uh, the real practice, what we mean by practice when we want to make sure that we have theory and practice united is uh, to understand that the pupil has to have an ocular demonstration. So I've prepared uh, an example where I have, uh, I think, a second lesson 
and I just ask the pupil to stand in front of a wall uh, that is very close by, that is set at uh, three inches backward relative to the heels. So I explained to the person that we call this a control situation where the person knows there is a wall and uh, she knows at what distance the wall is from her. And we are going to uh, enter into that uh, dimension that we call the control of human reaction. What do, what do we mean by control of human reaction? We don't want a, a direct inhibition of a movement because if you ask a person to simply calm down and uh, stop that movement, that is, uh, for example, pointed as a, a, a sign of agitation, that is nothing to do uh, with helping the person coordinate, helping the person function at the best level. Yes, you must understand that the more agitated a person is, the more difficult it is to coordinate ideas, uh, let alone coordinated actions. So, yes, there are unwanted movements, and these can be seen. That's where uh, practice enters into the picture. So, I want to share a screen where you will see uh, a reproduction, three different moments where the, the person is uh, starting to, well, observe what is uh, conscious guidance and control. So the first is, uh, the first on the left, the first image on the left is what we call uh, the habitual standing position. That's how the person stands habitually. And so, as I said, three inches further back than her heels, there is a wall. Here it's a door, but uh, we want a, a vertical frame of reference because uh, we explain to the pupil that uh, conscious guidance and control um, enlist, of course, the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the mind that, the mind that is uh, uh, constructed around speech. Uh, it's, it's what you say and what you decide. It's uh, what we, when we say, when we call a conscious decision, it means that it's something that you have deliberated. Deliberated means that you've been speaking about it with yourself, uh, weighing the pros and the contrasts. Yes. So, of course, uh, the person is standing deliberately. But uh, what we say is that the different movements of the parts of the torso are not deliberate. They are not uh, really reason, or if they are, uh, there is an unsound basis for the reasoning that, uh, in fact, promotes such, such type of standing. And then uh, the person is asked to prepare some decisions. We, we want the person to consider that she has a capacity to, in fact, somehow direct and control her movements. At first, uh, we don't go into details about explaining what we mean by guidance, what we mean by control, where is the difference between the two words, where do they merge together. We don't go into this. It's a very simple, basic lesson. And so we say to the person, uh, you could decide to fall backward. Uh, of, of course, the person can decide to fall backward and play with a reaction to uh, the habitual sense of equilibrium that is going to be triggered because the person is going to go out of her habitual way of standing in an equilibrium. And so we explain that there is a wall behind the person and uh, she can safely fall backward. She can reason out that there is no uh, instant danger of doing so. But the person is going to start uh, like we say, working with her feelings because uh, the way she, the person stands is based on a uh, somatic direction of use of the different movements of the part of the torso. The, the person has not really reasoned about it, it's just cultivated cultivated actions that have become uh, well compacted into one way and for the person that is standing upright. So, we asked the person whether she could uh, fall in a deliberate way and then uh, we asked the person to start representing 
her own self, as seen from the side. Of course, the person has no representation of herself from the side to start with, unless you tell a story to that person and ask her to follow a story where she would be looking, we pretend she would be looking at herself from the side. Obviously, when she's going to watch the video of her lesson, she will see herself. But for the moment, it's very important to understand that the person can use pretend thinking. She pretends to see herself from the side and she's going to represent herself with a very visually oriented uh, speech. And uh, we can uh, inform that story and we can say that there are three parts in the torso and we define the parts. We say that, of course, there is the lower part of the torso. We can even ask the person to notice where is the, the topmost part of the lower part of the torso. And then we will define the middle part of the torso right under the armpit. We have the person wear a ruler under the armpit and we say, you see, between the third lumbar vertebrae that we've just, well, found, I can direct the person to use the fingers to find where are bony spots. And so we are going to define three different areas in the torso seen from the side in our story. It's a, for, for the moment, it's just a, a verbal construction. And the person follows the story and uh, we end up with the third part and the third part goes right under the armpit, right up to, well, the top of the torso. We don't consider neck or head in these games. They're, they're, it's absolutely not necessary. It's all about the conscious guidance and control of the movements of the three different parts of the torso that have been defined. And so the game is to explain that we want to incorporate in our story some ugly mechanics. We, we want the person to be able to use a uh, uh, simple machines, simple representations of machines. There is one on the right, it's what we call a pendulum. And uh, in this case, it's an inverted pendulum. The inverted pendulum is not made with a rope and a weight. Uh, we replace the rope by uh, a rigid segment. So it's a very simplistic representation. And we say to the person that uh, uh, whether she can understand what is an inverted pendulum, if she, at first uh, some people are not used to these words, so we can make a very simple representation. For example, with just a pencil, we say, well, you can hold a pencil over uh, uh, a surface and you will find that uh, uh, that pencil will, will tend to fall. Well, yes, and uh, we can even make some quite interesting comments about uh, asking the person whether she would think that the small pendulum would fall small, uh, slower or would it fall faster than a very tall pendulum? And we can discuss around these things in, in, the, in such a way that we can have the person understand that when we see a representation or we discuss a representation seen from the side, as from, from the beginning of that story, uh, we say that there is a center of rotation at the ankle and the wall structure can be seen as uh, an inverted pendulum in space. So it's uh, subjected to uh, ugly mechanical laws. And there we can start to reason. So what we reason is that uh, we want the person to make very clear decisions of movements because uh, the person understands or if she does not, uh, we can make sure that she has the correct experience that uh, if she allows herself to fall back, uh, she will eat the wool. Well, very few people discuss that possibility, but if it was the case, we can have the person practice once and see whether uh, she would fall against the wall and she will. That's uh, that's a fact. A pendulum do fall and uh, if there is a wall behind them, they are stopped by the wall. So we can say that the pendulum, the inverted pendulum is falling against the wall. Then the question of decisions arise. The control of human reaction in Alexander's mind is the capacity to organize decision before an action occurs. 
especially if that action is habitual. Yes, it means that uh, it, it, it tends to recur time and time again. And in certain situations, the situation uh, brought a reaction. And if you know what reaction is brought about by the situation or by the stimulus contained in the situation, then you can start uh, to, in fact, interrupt your habitual way of reacting. And uh, as Alexander has a word for that, is they stick to your decisions. So what decisions are they? Well, there are three decisions. We ask the person to fall in a very, very deliberate manner. We want the person to fall with the middle torso touching the wall first. It's a story. Uh, of course, in each story, there is a quest. You have to go and, and look for something. What we want the person to look for is uh, the capacity to touch the wall with the middle torso first, not with the upper torso ever, not with the head leading the movement ever. Yes, but if the head leads the movement in leaning back, uh, obviously you're arching the back and the upper torso is going to touch the wall first. So it's, it's very clear for the person. Do you understand for your safety? You need to understand that you don't want to accelerate the, the upper torso faster than the middle torso. All the opposite. We want the middle torso to go back before the upper torso. Well, uh, very often I do start with only two decisions. I will come to the third decision later because uh, uh, the person will, st will start to discover that it's against uh, habitual reaction to go and fall with the middle torso decision kept and activated all the way, maintained all the way during the fall. Uh, well, all the way during the fall, it's a time you must understand that during these lessons, when I ask people to uh, organize movements, it's during two seconds. So the fall is quite long. Two seconds is a long fall. And so the person must keep to the decision to keep the middle torso acceleration greater than the upper or decelerate the upper torso all the time so that the shoulders stay away from the wall and you will find at first it's very difficult for the person to stop uh, one and uh, engage another action two actions are already not easy because this is uh, involved with the sense of equilibrium that is threatened the person uh, uh, is says to me, I am falling. Look, my toes are going off the floor. Well, I say, no, you're not. You're not falling yet. Say, I can tell you I'm falling. I know my body. Look, my toes are up. Yes, yeah, so explain why you're not touching the wall then. <laughs> if you're falling during two seconds, there should be a wall. It's uh, the principle of the pendulum. If the, if the pendulum is falling, it's, it's, uh, it's connected with the wall. For the moment, you're telling me your story is that you're falling. In fact, what you're telling me is what you feel. But what you feel is not exactly what we see on screen because uh, you're not touching the wall, the second image. The person is telling me I am falling uh, when, uh, according to the law of pendulum, she's not. So now there are, there are two truths. There is the one truth that is inside the person. The first person experience is I am falling. And there is a second truth is the ugly mecha mechanical one or the ugly mat mathematics that says, no, you're not. If you're not hitting the wall, <laughs> you're not. And so we have to discuss these things and uh, we have to, there, with stories, there are always these capacities to uh, confront stories and uh, listen to what the person has to say. The person tells me, I swear, I am falling. I am really falling and it's not pleasant. And I, I have to explain to the person that we have a different definition of the term falling. Uh, for me, falling belongs to technical words, to uh, ugly words, yes, I can admit, but um, th they have their function. They have a function of representation that is quite useful. Uh, there is a story about uh, the, um, uh, the shepherd that was always shouting for the wolf that was eating, and he, he was going to uh, the village saying, a wolf, a wolf is attacking the, the sheep. 
and uh, everybody would, uh, would come in arms. And of course, there was no wolf. Well, it's the same thing with the, he was telling a story. Yeah. And so the person is telling me a story in the second image, I'm falling backward and I'm say, telling a different story. No, there is no wolf. There is only the wolf is only when you get onto the wall. So we arrive at a, a situation where the person will start to understand the position of experiment uh, experimentation. What, what is experimentation? Well, it's confronting stories. You, you have an idea of something and you want to confront and create a control experiment to see if this idea is correct or not. So what we discover is that the person has a fear a real, a real fear of falling first, uh, falling uh, like the wolf, not falling like uh, going and telling that there is a wolf when there is none, of course. So the, the person has a, a, a type of reaction. And curiously, that type of reaction is associated with the movement she's normally doing when she's standing upright doing nothing. So if she's doing nothing, she's feeling fine, that's the first image. But in fact, uh, the same movement she's doing, yes, she's accelerating the upper torso, she's trying as much as she can to decelerate the middle torso. And uh, she's protruding the abdomen, she's shortening the back, and this is a reaction to, uh, well, a, a potential threat to the postural uh, system. She's making that. So then we come to the moment when she can override her feeling guidance and let herself fall against the wall, real, in the, the real sense of the world. And uh, the real in ugly mechanics, of course. And so then we find that there is a need of a third uh, decision. There was one decision not to accelerate the top of the torso and a decision to accelerate the back back, the back of the middle torso back. But there is a third one now that we discover in the experiment is that the person is not eating the wall with the middle torso first. She's eating the wall with the buttocks first. And so uh, it's just because we had we started with the story where the person would eat the wall with the middle torso back first that uh, ev everything has sense for the moment. The person is just involved in following a story. Human beings are fantastic. They can use stories to, to, to their advantage to explore, to, uh, to create theories and, and experiments. And so it takes uh, no less than one lesson for the person to be able to, uh, in fact, uh, create the representation, the sideway representation that doesn't has nothing to do with what the person uh, feels or how the person somatically represents herself. Uh, nobody represents uh, the self as a pendulum, as an inverted pendulum, but it's it's suddenly what she's doing after after um, i don't know 40 minutes and then uh, she starts to discover what it is to direct uh, the movements of three parts of the torso consciously and the effect is what it is it's not fantastic it's not great but uh, still we have a very visual uh, alexander use another expression he says ocular demonstration and the ocular demonstration is not only uh, the last image, it's the three images and the film that the person is going to see. The person is going to see how she stands without conscious, deliberated actions coordination. And she's going to see uh, what is the effect of following a story where she can uh, command, order uh, a series of movements simultaneously. That's the basis of uh, conscious guidance and control. You need to have a model. If you have no model, uh, well, you may have no more, have a somatic model, which is for me no model. It's that you, you, you have a feeling inside of what is uh, right. Well, to start with, it's obvious that my pupil has no inside feeling of what is right. Uh, what is right is to lengthen and widen the back. What is right is to have the head forward and up. What is right is to be lifted with the gravity affecting, well, influencing and aiding 
the limbs and trunk, which is what you see in the third image. So the third image uh, is very strange uh, because it's uh, the, at the end of the lesson, it's the moment of, uh, uh, of discovery. The discovery is that I'm asking the person, how little effort would you need to fall forward? I'm, I'm, I'm explaining the question. We have the, the model of the pendulum. And uh, if we ask a person, imagine a pendulum is set absolutely upright. Okay. How much effort, if you are, you, you are holding it, are you making with your finger to hold it, if it's perfectly vertical? It's a difficult question. The answer is none. Yes, because the weight of the, of the structure is correctly aided and influenced by the force of gravity. It's the sentence Alexander is using, which means that you have a, a vertical alignment. Yes, we are going to see that this vertical alignment is not exactly what most people think. Well, <coughs> so there is no effort to be made to let the, the pendulum fall. You just take up your finger and you will find that uh, the pendulum is going to start to fall. Well, if there is a wall behind it, you have uh, restricted. Uh, the, the, the pendulum can only fall in some directions forward. That's all. So I'm asking the person how much effort she needs in order to fall forward. And um, I'm going to ask her to, if there is an, an effort to be made, and very often there is, uh, because the pendulum is not set properly yet, I'm going to ask the person to, to start to move the tip of the elbow that I see from the side. I can see the tip of the elbow. I can ask the person to locate with an index finger where is the, uh, the bone of the elbow that is sticking out and further away from the shoulder. The person will feel that bone. Yes, it's a bony part. And I will ask the person to see whether it's possible to move the tip of the elbow and not the hand. <laughs> a very strange uh, contraption. You can move the, the elbow and not the hand. Yes, it's not absolutely nice, but it's possible. And then you will find that in that case, the tendency for the upper part of the arm is going to go forward in space. And when the, the upper parts of the arm are going forward in space, there is a tendency for the back to widen uh, because there is a shoulder girdle. The, the, the shoulder blades are attached with very powerful muscles to the spine, to the upper thoracic spine. And so when the person is going to start to move the elbows forward, without our knowledge, our, our shoulder blades are going to slide around uh, the, the rib cage and uh, widen get away from each other and start to pull on the muscles that are attached to the upper spine so that the upper thoracic spine is going to have a tendency to go forward and upward so that the cervical spine will have uh, the same tendency because it's the same spine. So if the uh, upper thoracic spine goes forward and up, well, the uh, cervical spine that is just above it will follow and the head will even be more forward than it is relatively to the back. At that moment, the person will discover that, well, I need to make no effort to fall forward. Which means that the person is not inclined backward when she is against the wall, three inches away from it. Which means that the person is always inclining the torso forward when she is standing. She has a habit of having the pendulum set forward and down. Yes, and uh, as a result of this position in space, there is an absolute need to keep the shoulders back. Otherwise, the person would be, would be putting more and more because uh, there is something about, about structures that are inclined relative to gravity. They tend to fall more with time. Yeah, if you construct a wall, you will not construct a wall inclined. So uh, we are telling a story we are asking the person to uh, construct a representation and this representation involves decisions of movements that have to be uh, performed simultaneously. The person has very little uh, uh, experience of thinking more than one or two decisions. Well, when you say three or four, well, you are in a completely new uh, world for that person. But, well, it's, a, it's the idea, it's a discovery. The person is going to discover what it is. 
So now, when we talk about representation, you have to understand that we cannot represent the complexity of the uh, muscular system. The muscular system is, is way, way too complex. There are 700 muscles, but it's not only the, num the sheer number. It's the fact that muscles first have uh, the same muscle can have different directions of action. You can, with the same muscle, direct the shoulder blade up, out, back or in. So that's the difficulty. But there is another one. Um, it's that uh, muscle change shape when you produce a movement involving that muscle. So you cannot control how the muscle is from the start and how the muscle is at the, uh, the end. It's too complex. So it's necessary to use uh, another system of representation. We use bones. We, we can notice where are the bones, yes? Well, there are, uh, of course, tools that can tell you how the bones are constructed and uh, how the person is standing. So uh, there are very obvious uh, things that you can use. You don't need to know how to read a, an X-ray, but it's, it's absolutely clear that we can see bones on X-rays. And on this bone, we can see what the person is seen doing with the different parts of the torso is quite clear. The person is seen, in fact, trying to set uh, the lumbar region exactly on top of the bone of the leg. And uh, as you can see, this has consequences. And so when the person tries to get the, 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 the middle back forward to set the back weight or the back load above the leg, well, we know this shape. We've seen it before. Yes, we have already told that story. We see that uh, uh, there is the front of the pelvic bone, I call the iliac. There is the lower part of the sternum bone that I call lower sternum. And uh, uh, these bones do not change when you move them. You can make a decision. You can have a decision to move the, the lower torso. It's, it's going to move the bone of the pelvis. Yes, but the bone of the pelvis is not going to be changed by it. It's going to change only its position in space that is uh, acceptable that is controllable you can you can measure whether a person has the front of the iliac crest forward of the foot or not in this case it's absolutely obvious that uh, the the pupil in a way to cope with uh, equilibrium what a feeling sense tells her to do is to bring the lower uh, sacrum, the lower sternum, sorry, and the front of the iliac bone very far forward of the support of the pendulum. A useful story we were telling about the pendulum now uh, can be well uh, understood as something, well, a, a quite a very difficult representation of reality. So we see that uh, uh, the tendency of the person, and, uh, there are green spots, that are what I say you can see, a uh, green spot that the person can locate quite easily when you instruct the person to find, uh, for example, the front of the ilium bone or lumbar three or the lower sacrum. These are spots that are, that are very easy to, to find and incorporate into a story. So we will see that the person has a tendency systematically to have, for example, lumbar three, the third lumbar uh, process of the vertebrae, very far forward of the lower sacrum. Or you could say that she is lifting or pulling the lower sacrum back. Uh, obviously, uh, when the person is well, maintaining your decisions between the two seconds uh, amount of time, we can see that suddenly, well, uh, the position of the bone is completely transformed. So we come to a representation that is where uh, lumbar three and the lower sacrum are exactly uh, set above one each other. And we see now uh, a new representation where uh, the iliac is uh, set exactly above the front of the knee, exactly above the front of the, of the foot. Uh, remember how far forward the person has a tendency. Look here, uh, because of the three inches and the, the, decision, the decisions she has not made with the knees, the iliac is very far forward still. 
it's it, well uh, you can start to imagine new dispositions yes and in this new disposition suddenly uh, the lumbar region is not above the axis of support of the leg nowhere near it's really really far back it's uh, uh, the back of the middle torso idea is seen here represented it's represented as a rotation of the pelvis around a uh, center that is the front of course of the pelvis where uh, there is the hip joint yes but the hip joints compared uh, if you compare this image with the image just before that we have here but it's uh, it's not only down it's also very far forward of the front of the ankle so the person in this uh, image is falling upright there is no wall but the person can in imagine falling against a, a wall that is not there that's exactly what's happening here that person does not feel upright that person is, is seen uh, poised Poised means uh, ready to fall in any direction. Poise has nothing to do with stability. This uh, organization has nothing to do with stability. Unless, unless you know of something. Because, uh, of course, in this position, you will see that uh, uh, the weight of the torso and uh, the reaction force coming from the floor are set at quite a lever distance. We call that the lever arm of that uh, uh, bone. So we consider the pelvis as a lever and in between you've got one segment that is pressing up from the floor Newton law and on the other we have, we have the weight pressing down so this structure is not in static equilibrium ever it's rotating if you have two actions acting on a lever that lever is rotating this should collapse yet uh, the pupil is not seen to collapse so there must be an explanation for that it's, we don't believe in magics. It's not because you lengthen and widen the back that suddenly everything holds, that uh, the right thing does itself. No, no, no. Uh, this person is involved in uh, sticking to a series of uh, decisions that is a bit more numerous than just wanting to have the middle torso go back. There is another thing, another story then. So here is the story. Uh, it's the ITB story, if you want to call it. It's, it, it means iliotibial tract. So when you take a human being, well, preferably dead, and you take the skin off and you look inside, so you look at the side of, of course, the torso and the side of the thigh, and suddenly you discover a giant uh, whitish blue structure. Uh, there is uh, the same structure at the front and the back of the torso, but there is also the same from the lower torso to the lower knee. It's a, a well, a structure that is made of fascia, of uh, elastic connective tissue, reinforced connective tissue. And uh, uh, it's quite interesting to, to have a read about fascia to have a read about the iliotibial tract. The iliotibial tract is very well known because uh, it's, uh, it's so massive that uh, surgeons, are, uh, well, for many, many years, have uh, taken bits and pieces every time they needed to uh, strengthen a, a rotator cup or uh, a knee, or th they would take some of the ITB because it's uh, so strong. This is as strong as steel. So you start wondering, why is no one using it? Because uh, there is a problem with fascia, is if this extremity of the fascia is not, in fact, lengthened and loaded, we'll explain the terms later, well, lengthening is easy, when if you don't stretch it, well, it's limp, it doesn't do anything. If you want to stretch it, you have to uh, well create the length between the lower knee and the iliac. 
but it's not sufficient. For example, you, you can't uh, have any sort of uh, uh, force uh, as strong as steel when the person is lying down. Yeah, in lying down, uh, this is going to be to amount to no mechanical action whatsoever. You, you can't you can't stimulate it. In order to stimulate it, you need to have the person sitting or standing. Well, standing is better. Any upright position is fine. Where you can get the back back, yes, and the hips as far back as is possible. These are uh, words that I repeat. Uh, not like because I, I'm a priest and I want to, uh, I have faith in these words. No, uh, just because they were instructions used by F.M. Alexander. And instructions have nothing to do like pr prayer or anything, uh, yeah, pure imagination. No, no, no. It has something very, very practical about it. Yes, when the hips are as far back as is possible, then suddenly uh, the, 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 the load can happen. What, what do we mean by load? Load is a, a constitutive word, like if I translate of another word that is a French word, is poise. What is load and how do you understand poise? What is the representation of poise? Well, to have load, you need two actions. A weight is not a load. A load is a weight carried. Uh, so when you imagine load as a weight that is carried, you're much closer to poise than uh, if you use uh, the simple action of everything falls. Yeah. So when you carry, you suddenly have one force going from the reaction of the floor to the weight of the structure. So you know when you press uh, a stick onto a surface, well, the sur if the surface is strong enough, it's going to push your hand up. You will not be able to go down, yes? And that, that push-up can be really easily shown by the fact that if you press the palm of your hand on a stick that is set on the floor, you will find that your hand gets red, that it gets pushed up. Yes, you're pushing your hands down, the sting is pushing your hand up. So here we see this, we see uh, the representation, the story of load, the story of poise. In order to get uh, this giant system to work to your advantage, you must understand that if you can load the back. So first of all, you must notice that the image on the right that is uh, showing the iliotibial tract is set in the old mode of representation. It's exactly as if the person was leaning forward. Look, it's, uh, it's amazing. These representation are only on the, uh, well, lower sacrum spot is very much further back relative to lumbar three. So that person is not lengthening the back. This person is curving the back. It's not the representation that the person has discovered in this image where the back is back. So now the weight of the torso is acting way back relative to the support that is, well, transmitted upward by the bone of the leg. So now we have a new effect. Yes, it's a moment of forces. There is a rot constant rotation downwards. It's, uh, this structure can only rotate down and back, yes? And it's not because suddenly we see that this rotation down and back is going to stretch the iliotibial tract. It's going to lift the knee in some ways. The side of the knee is lifted by the sheer action of the weight down. And so uh, our story is um, increased uh, we, we understand why we want the back to go back, why we want the hips to be as far forward, as far backward, sorry, as is possible. Is suddenly, we can suddenly uh, get the iliotibial tract under load. And that means that uh, the person is starting to use forces that are not muscular, that are not um, uh, wasting uh, elements and forces that are lengthening in nature. Because there, there are two kinds of tension in the story I'm telling. There is the tension that will create compression, 
compresses for compressing forces on the joints compressing forces on the tissues and there are other tensions there are tensions that are tending to lengthen this is a tension that is tending to extend the leg it's not a tension that is compressing the leg down. No, we set the back back. It's not this image, of course, it's this one. It's because this one, uh, the back is set forward. But when we set the back back, suddenly the back is acting behind the, the, the heel very much. It's in open, open, open space. It's falling. Well, if it's falling, it's then pulling upwards the front of the pelvic bone. The front of the pelvic bone is pulled upward and backward. As a result, it's pulling on the iliotibial tract, stretching it. Alexander has a word for this. He calls this antagonistic pulls. The person is starting to employ antagonistic pulls. The person is creating due pressure. So when you follow this, you suddenly start to see Alexander's concept differently. Here, look at what he says. The properly coordinated person employs a due amount of tension in such a way that the tendency of the spine and legs is to lengthen. And the equilibrium is such that the undue pressure through the floor is absent. And there is a lightness and freedom in the movements of such a person that is most noticeable. It's funny. It's funny. Uh, words sometimes are funny in the story you tell. The person employs a due amount of tensions. When you employ a tension, you don't create, you don't make the, you don't uh, exercise to to perform the tension. No, the tension is given to you. Well, uh, in this case. Uh, the tension is given to you by the proper position of the different parts and this position is assumed uh, thanks to a series of decisions of movement that are simultaneous. We go back to conscious guidance. We, we understand now conscious guidance as a very practical view of representation or story of uh, what we see and what we say when uh, new pupils enter uh, the teaching room. Well, it's, uh, of course, a long distance lesson. The teaching room is uh, virtual. But nonetheless, the person is experimenting with uh, a story, the power of the word, they call it sometimes. And uh, you start to think, OK, fine. Uh, that person can use that story for herself. She doesn't need a special uh, somatic teacher uh, always present or always needing to come back. No, the person can, uh, well, experiment with this and uh, film herself because she cannot see herself from the side. So it's much better. She will have an ocular demonstration as seen from the side of what she's capable of doing. And then we will come into more complex stories where we, this notion of antagonistic pools becomes a, a fact of the story. I am very, very clear on this. Uh, these uh, springs that you can see represented here are, of course, uh, imaginary. Uh, it's a much more complex system than the one that is represented here. But the simplification has some, has some value and benefits. Uh, one value is that, uh, of course, uh, there is not only one problem with fascia. There are more. And the, the second major one, I don't know if it's not the first, the, the first problem is that you get the fascia to work for you. You can employ fascia forces only if you find ways to geometrically lengthen the tissues. If, uh, if you perform movement that are shortening the tissues, these fascia are useless, really useless. And they, they waste and they, I don't know, it's very bad. Yeah, but if you start to have a story where you can uh, make decisions of movements in order to load 
springs, fascia, all then it's very interesting with the second cavity and the second cavity is that you won't feel when it's stretched. You, you don't feel it. Uh, well, you, you will, uh, f f in fact, discover the effects, but you will not feel uh, the, the tension load of the, f the, the fascia. There are very little uh, uh, sensory captors, receptors in these fascia, and uh, we, are not, we are not used first to uh, sense them. So most of the time you will see a person that is able that. So look at this. This is another student uh, and uh, is standing and is loading the fascia. It's absolutely obvious. I don't need to feel anything. It's obvious that he's loading the fascia because uh, the geometry is such that it's absolutely obvious that the pelvic uh, support is very far forward of the load of the torso. The load of the torso is going always through the spine. So we know where the spine is because we can poke and touch and we will find that uh, the lower sacrum and lumbar three are nearly aligned in this as if this gentleman was falling against the wall. Of course, he's not. What he's doing is a bit different. Uh, in this story, uh, we start to, in fact, realize that when the person is falling, uh, it's exactly what we said. Uh, the lower sternum is exactly above the front of the instep. So uh, in order to make that absolutely certain, we get a control condition where the person before standing measure the distance from the front of the instep to the wall. And just after that, we ask the person to use exactly the same ruler distance from the lower sternum bone to the wall. So I know and the person knows, the student knows at that moment that he's standing with the lower sternum exactly above the instep spot. So you, we can check whether the iliac is on the same line. And uh, I can tell you it is. And I can tell you it is not because I've measured. I haven't. It's just because I'm looking at the back and I can see that the, there is a direct line from the T7, the, the seventh thoracic to the lower sacrum. I can place a ruler on it and all the back process of the vertebrae are set on it. So it's obvious. Yes, uh, it's a condition that can be, uh, in fact, implemented only with the upper torso very, very far forward. Uh, we are not discussing a pure stacking of elements. It's absolutely necessary to understand that we are using the load of the upper torso being while well, the upper thoracic spine is very that's the T1 the the top of the thoracic spine is more or less where the top of the uh, shirt is at the back and that is very far forward of the line of the back. So as a result, the well, cervical spine is very far forward. And of course, the head is very far forward. We need that action of the upper torso forward in order to stretch the muscles and the fascia of the back as springs at the back. So the person is going to use exactly the same story to, in fact, bend the torso at the hips. The person bend the, the torso at the hips and knees, you see, and we can see that the person does this and the story goes that, uh, well, of course, the middle torso is not going forward in space. Well, we know it's not because uh, the ruler is still there. So unless the ruler is entering the, the sternum bone, <laughs> it's absolutely obvious that the person is balanced with the middle torso just exactly above the instep. So this is a representation. This is the power of representation, the power of the story. The person is, uh, is alone in his room. I am 10,000 or 20,000 kilometers away. And the person is experimenting with what stories can uh, bring as experiments. The person is experimenting with this lengthening, widening, length, and getting the neck to, to lengthen and be free and getting the head forward and up. And so uh, we have here um, uh, ways to use uh, stories. So you see a triangle of increasing length. What could that mean? Well, they are just uh, decisions. Uh, they are just uh, um, 
orders that the person can use imagine that you uh, you reflect that the knee is staying at exactly the same distance from the wall so the knee is exactly above the instep line so from the knee the person can think of extending the distance from the front of the knee to uh, the lower ribs on the side of the torso. It's a spot that is very easy to find. If you touch your side of your torso above uh, the pelvis, you will find first the abdomen when there is no ribs, but then suddenly you will encounter ribs. Yes, bony parts that resist the touch. Well, you can, of course, uh, place your, scoop your finger beneath these ribs and find which one is the lowest on the side. Not at the back, because there are two at the back, but we are not interested. We are interested by the lowest one on the side. That gentleman is not touching it, but he's certainly thinking about it because he's increasing the distance between this lower rib and the knee. And I know it uh, just because of the shape of the back. It's impossible to have the back back in this way uh, without really lengthening the distance from the lowest ribs on the side of the torso and the side of the knee. But he's doing more. He's also wanting to get the lower sternum as far away upward relatively to the lower ribs on the side of the torso. It's, it's just the story because it's, it's said that in the story, if you can maintain the decisions, the two decisions to uh, go away from the knee with the lower ribs on the side of the torso and to go away from it with the lower sternum, then you're lengthening the distance between the front of the knee and the lower sternum. And uh, what uh, we can do after the performance has been done, we can well measure to see if it's true or not. That's what's fantastic with these stories. You can always consciously control whether you're going in the right direction, supposed by the theory, or whether the theory is wrong and you're going in the opposite direction. In fact, uh, this is part of, uh, I'm going to narrow the image so that you can see it, if it wants to work, that's it. You know, it's part of a, a procedure. The story here is the increasing length when uh, the person is going to sit on a chair. So it's a, a new um, deliberate way to maintain equilibrium that is the ugly sense of equilibrium in physics, equilibrium at all stage of the, the moment so that the person is the, the tendency to lengthen the legs and lengthen the torso is present at each stages of the performance of the experiment. And this is taken, our pictures of course still pictures, but you have to understand this has been done in two seconds. It's quite, it's not, it doesn't take that long. So, when you perform action fast, and you will find that in the Alexander Technique, it's not the case in the modern Alexander Technique, but in the initial Alexander Technique, we ask always person to perform action fast. We don't want the person to feel every moment of the descent, certainly not, because if it's the case, this will trigger the habitual habits of being directed by feeling straight away, and the person will be incapable of maintaining decisions. The person is going to concentrate on one feeling that is saying that one decision is not implemented and forget all the others. In order to get a coordinated decisions, it's necessary to perform the decision as one, uh, instantly. And you will, you will check later whether it has been going according to plan or not. So this is the interest of stories. This is the interest of representation. There is one last thing I want to show you. Uh, when you, uh, you see this image, it's now the same person and the same rules uh, applied, but in, uh, in sitting and uh, the person is doing something that uh, was uh, absolutely uh, uh, repetitive in Alexander's uh, lessons, apparently. I asked Walter Carrington and he said that he was uh, having people lean back all the time. So during the lesson, uh, 1951 lesson that is recorded on film, this is an excerpt from the film, uh, when he works with the gentleman, he, he, no less than six times does he, does he have him uh, lean backward in, uh, uh, on the chair. 
maintaining, of course, the uh, the shape of the back with his hands. We see that there is his left hand that is behind uh, the back, just above the armpit, maintaining the uh, antagonistic action so that uh, the upper thoracic spine and the upper cervical spine is really maintained forward in going back. Never, uh, this is what Irene Tarska reported. It's uh, never lead with the head when leaning back. And so we have an explanation, well, a representation of what it means. But the story is more interesting though now, because we see that in going back with the torso, there is a way to load the iliotibial tract differently. You can load the iliotibial tract uh, by having the upper torso move backward, yes? And so you have to make certain that when you move backward, uh, the speed, the relative speed, uh, the del Sartean, they use an expression that we are going to discuss, I think, very shortly, the proportion of movements that the mind can apply on the body. This is an expression of the proportion of movement that the mind can apply on the body. We want that uh, when we say never lead, uh, never allow the head to lead in leaning back. It's uh, never allow a proportion of movement that is incorrect at the upper torso relative to the middle and lower torso. So you, uh, you can see that in the initial exam, the technique, uh, of course, we can teach online because uh, we don't use hands, as Alexander did. But uh, uh, the idea is to uh, help the person start to uh, take control of their decisions. Take control of, uh, uh, if, for example, you say, I want to stop agitating my hands. I need to understand that uh, I will be capable of organizing my actions much better if I have a plan, if I have a story representing how things are connected and how the mechanisms are moving, uh, how the parts of the mechanisms are moving to produce the functions we are interested in. So. This is the, the view of the initial Alexander Technique. Be very careful. In the modern Alexander Technique, the, the story is absolutely different. It's absolutely uh, impossible to compare with what I have explained. They are not interested in ugly mechanics. They are not interested in, in combining uh, coordination of movements. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different thing. Any question? I really love this idea of integrating stories with the movements of the mechanisms and the different parts because it gives a different um, way of looking at, a different way of understanding how the orders work. They're part of the integrated structure as a whole and the movement as a whole. Whereas sometimes I think with pupils or newer pupils, the orders might seem like isolated instructions that you just kind of... Um, bark at yourself separately from everything else when really there there should be part of a, a greater whole because when you're telling the story there's there's multiple um characters in the story and they're yeah. doing different actions relative to one another and there are tensions in the story there yeah. are some things that go against each other and this is what drives a story forward and it's also based on the antagonistic action and the uh, the bark of the fascia it's what drives movements forward as well if we're using ourselves uh, optimally. Yeah. And there is, um, uh, behind all this, uh, this idea that uh, this is what education is about. Uh, we don't educate the somatic feeling sense. We educate the person in a, in a way of, uh, of using our mind. Telling story is using the mind. I, I think very close to what Alexander thought about. Yeah, and people and are narrating a story about their yeah. movements themselves all the time anyway in their in yeah. their inner dialogue. Um, sometimes it's obviously mixed up with sensations and feelings, but they're really you. There are habitual feelings and sensations that are kind of part of the story about how they move. And this, what we're doing really here, is just making it more explicit, yeah. making the story more explicit, and then experimenting with it and seeing. What does the new story do? What do we see happen after the new story? Rather than just trust the old story 
and uh, assume that it must be right because it feels right. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you, Sondo. Uh, we'll Thanks leave it here. Time. And for people watching the video, you will find a link underneath to John Doe's website where you can book a lesson with him and learn some new stories. And we will see you in the next video. Thanks, John Doe. Thank you.